on the Jacob Beer Show today, I'm so happy to have on Rudy Zarzo, who's a man of many different titles, currently with Quiet Ride, <laughs> which you started with about 40 years ago and you're with currently. You've 45. Lost 45 years. You've also um, been the bass sit for Ozzy Osbourne and several other bands. How are you doing today? I'm blessed. How about you? How are you doing? I'm blessed too. We're almost through the semester in college. so <laughs> All right. It's a little bit cold, though, where I'm at. I know you're on Pacific time, so it must be a little bit warmer over there. It's a little bit cold in the Midwest. So you're coming to Ohio next month, so um, bundle up. Yes, and you probably know more about it than I do because, you know, <laughs> we we do so many shows, it's hard for me to keep track of it. You know, like, like in the old days uh, when we toured, and I mean like 40 years ago, let's say, let's say for the mental health, so that yesterday was the uh, anniversary of the album reaching, being the first debut by a metal band to reach number one on Billboard magazine. And uh, yesterday, so right now we're, in, and it lasts for a week. So in, in that week of right now, 40 years ago, Metal Health was number one in the charts. Wow. And uh, so I want to take you back to that time. You know, back then you would do tours by sections of the country it wasn't as centralized as it, is, as it is today with like life nation and aeg as being the promoters of all the big shows so if there was a big show coming back then it was done by local a, a network of local promoters that will work with one agency our agent let's say and then they will they will take section of the united states like the east coast you know northeast the middle east you know the uh the Mideast, like, you know, from uh, from Georgia all the way to the Carolinas or even Virginia, and then down to Florida. That would be the South. And then they will, you know, then we, we would do weeks at a time, like six weeks, take one week off, another six weeks back on. And back then we used to get itineraries, like booklets, right? And you could see where you were going to be at and the routing and when the day's off and stuff like that. Nowadays, it's a bit different. Nowadays, most of the bands in our genre, you know, the 80s bands, we balance it by being able to be with our families during the week, which is great because back in the day, you would just leave for, you know, uh, I've been on tour for a year and a half with Ozzy, uh, Quiet Ride and White Snake. I was just gone on a tour bus. And now we fly, which, you know, has the pros and cons, you know, with flying, with transportation. But giving the opportunity to spend time with your family during the week is really a blessing. And it's such a really good balance. And I think it makes, makes us better musicians because we're not longing for either home or the stage. We get both the same week. Interesting. And you yeah. get a little bit of rest, I'm sure, in between. Um, well, actually, I used to rest much more in the tour bus because you, you get off the stage, you do your meet and greet, you know, you grab something to eat, you go to your bunk, you go to sleep, you wake up, there you are and then in the next city. Uh, nowadays, it's it's more challenging, but uh, the reward of being able to be home, it's, it's it just uh, makes everything, you know, more leaning towards like, I really enjoy what I'm doing at the moment, how we're traveling. Interesting. Yeah. And um, what would you say something? So kind of going back a little bit before you started touring, um, what got you involved in music? You have an interesting background, of course. Um, you're not the typical musician by some standards. So take us through kind of how you got involved and how that became your passion. Because, you know, somebody who interviews people, the top jobs in entertainment and music or in television or whatever, very rare do people get to make it that far to do it for a living to even make 30 40 grand a year off of it you know very rarely do people get to do that their passion how did you kind of get to that point well you know it's it's interesting that, that you brought in uh the financial aspect of being a musician because when i started out all i wanted to do was play i i used to play for free a lot and and or play for a little money or enough money for gas it's the things that you do because, you know, first of all, you believe that you're on your way, some, that you're on a journey. This is part of your journey. And, and then you become, your identity becomes a musician. So 
you know, which is unfortunately with a lot of us because we, we take get taken advantage of as musicians because we love what we do so much that sometimes the price that we pay is that uh, we don't get what we deserve. So, but then, you know, nobody really puts a gun to our heads to say, well, if you want to play, you got to do this. You can always say no and wait for the next opportunity. But, uh, but yeah, we love what we're doing. And sometimes it's because of the people that we're doing it with that we say, okay, well, I'm not going to make as much money as I, as I, you know, think I should, my value, but nevertheless, I'm playing in this band. And it's like, wow, okay. Because at the end of the day, that's what you really take with you to the next level, you know, in your, in your journey as experience, you take the experience of being, uh, sharing music with these magnificent people that, that you, uh, that, that you respect and you love or, or maybe even grew up listening to, you know? So it's, it's, it's not the same answer for everybody to the same question, you know? And again, so taking away the money aspect of it, you know, I, I was, I was really, I knew that I wanted to be a musician probably for the wrong reason or maybe the right reason. I don't know, but it was, I saw the, the Beatles and Ed Sullivan and you know, I liked them. I liked what I saw, what I heard. That was the first time I was really exposed to their music. But once they panned the camera to the girls in the audience going nuts, that's that that sold the deal for me. That's what I want. I want that adulation from from females. And you know, I was just a kid. I just turned thirteen years old, and at thirteen in in, in junior, I was a junior high. You become basically invisible unless you're like a sports you know like an athlete happened to be a quarterback or whatever in, the, in the whatever team that the uh th that the school is popular with so i just uh, i saw the beatles and i said this is this is what i really want to do with life you know and uh after a few years you know I, I, just about every every kid in the neighborhood got the same impression but only a few of us carried on and that's because within a few years you 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 know yes you start getting the adulation and the attention yeah we just got attention you know one or two girls that just because we happen to be in the high school band you know rock band playing parties and you know that you start you start getting noticed and they like the music and you know that bonding and all of that and then you 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 know you have to make a decision okay i, I am where am i going to take this the music because it's not just you cannot, you're not really going to make it by making it a hobby or making it the reason why, you know, you're getting uh, attention from females. You have to dedicate, you have to become a musician, which means that that's the only reason why you're doing it is because you want to be a musician. You have finally connected and understood what music, the power of music, just like the power of love. The power of love led me to music but it was music that really showed me the true meaning of the power of love, you know? So uh, that's when you start spending hours in your room, practicing, dedicating yourself, playing all the time, uh, you know, just uh, uh, jamming with a lot of guys and nowadays girls too. I mean, back, back then, unless there were a singer or a keyboard player, there were not a whole lot of females uh in the rock thing you know and um I, I i gotta tell you it's 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 a journey that e even today i get up i get up every morning I go to youtube and now i have the advantage of lessons lessons in more uh advanced musical uh theories such as harmony and modal jazz and so on. So now I can really pick and choose and get deeper into what I really hear in my head and understand it and be able to communicate better with other musicians or be more creative. You know, um, it's that connection between the inside of my head and my heart and my hands, knowing I hear something, but what am I playing? You know, having that that sort sort of understanding. And I get that from uh from all of the wonderful teachers, musicians that share that information with all of us on social media, like YouTube and so on. 
Interesting. And um, for you, would you say, do you have a favorite concert venue that you've ever performed? I'm trying to think of questions that you haven't been asked. You've been asked a billion questions yeah. about Ozzy Osbourne stuff. You've been asked yeah. a billion questions about, you know, albums over the years. Have you ever revealed maybe a place that you really haven't talked much about that you enjoyed going to to perform? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it happens to be in Indi Indi uh, in Indianapolis, the former Market Square Arena. Uh, I've done many concerts there, and one of the most significant ones was the one that we did with Quiet Riot. See, we were on tour with 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 Lover Boy in 1983, and our lifestyles did not gel. They thought that we we're, were a little too crazy for them. So they just did not pick up the, the option for the second leg of the tour. So we here we are, we're like six weeks off and our agent put together quickly a uh, a tour, you know, with, as a matter of fact, with Queensryche uh, as, well, as one of the support bands. And they didn't even have a record out yet. They had the wow. EP, uh, Queen, Queen of the Reich, this is 1983. And uh, so, you know, I had just done the Market Square Arena with Ozzy the year before with uh, with Randy in the band. And and I knew how massive it was. And I'm going like, oh, my God, you know, we were we just been opening for these other bands like ZZ Top and Scorpions and, uh, and Loverboy. And oh, wow. You know, I mean, it would be nice if we could sell some some seats. And the and the uh, the agent goes, yeah, don't worry, because what we'll do is we're gonna put a curtain in front of it, so we're we're gonna sell the first few thousand seats, and then as they sell, they move the curtain back. So so they did. They started selling the ticket, and by the time that we did the gig, we we played in the round, every single seat in front of us and behind us on the sides. They were all sold out. No curtains. And no curtain. Nowhere. Wow. <laughs> and it was like, oh my god! And that's about is, twenty thousand people. Yeah, yeah that's it was, the, it was massive. Yeah, massive. And uh, I assume also I, the year before you were with Ozzy, you you completely sold that out as well. Oh that yeah, we did. But, but two years but, in a row with different people and bands. Yes, and coming back with a band that was a brand new band, and you know what happens is when you're on your first tour. Your set list is the album. Well, nowadays it's a CD, so you probably have more songs. But back in the day, a vinyl could only carry no more, recommend that no more than 40 minutes, 20 minutes per side. Because if you start adding more music to it, the grooves get tighter. And that means that the low end will make, if you have like normal low end, because the grooves are so tight, the needle doesn't go in deep enough with low end, it will make the needle skip. So that was, there was a a maximum a time per side, right? Now with CDs, you didn't have that problem. It's all digital and it picks it up, right? And then now that it's, uh, you know, most, most of the bands either release like, most, you know, double albums nowadays or maybe just singles one at a time because it's, because it's mostly streaming now. Yes, you're going to have some groups releasing the the old vinyl you know which is great i love vinyl i think it sounds best the best representation of what it actually sounds in the control room while it was being mixed i've always got that from vinyl you know from bling when it gets transferred from the analog tape that it gets bounced to goes to mastering then it makes it gets mastered as vinyl and there's an actual vinyl mastering it's not digital mastering it's vinyl it's, it's to give you an acetate acetate is like a temporary you can't really play a whole lot because it's not real vinyl but it's acetate and uh, it will wear off but you can play like at least 10 times and get and and then sign off on it saying yes this is the mastering because you know you go through stages you go to recording then you go through mixing and then you go you take it to mastering and that's the final step that's when it becomes a record or uh, you know, nowadays it's delivered in so many different formats, streaming, CDs, vinyl, and so on. But uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, and then a couple other questions I have. Is it ever tough at times, you know, walking through airports <clears throat> or, you know, 
trying to get off the stage and, and, and fans are trying to talk to, you know, get your signature, get a quick photo. What's that like? And now it's been like 40 years, you know, where you've been in the spotlight like that. Is it ever tough at times? Yes, yeah, actually 42. And I got to tell you, because I know how my life was like, I never lose sight of it before, before I actually got the phone call to, uh, to audition for Ozzy and I got the gig. And here I am, you know, 42 years later, you know, life was, was, uh, life was, was dim. It didn't look very bright. It did not. So for me to get upset because somebody who wants to come up to me and, and tell me that they appreciate the music that we make. Are you kidding? I, 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 I do that to my favorite musicians when I see them. Who are some and of your favorite musicians? Everybody. <laughs> God, I can't even <laughs> just stop to think of one. We don't have enough time on this podcast. <laughs> Fair but, enough. So, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate what everybody does. And and usually, you know, especially the, the musicians who we had to go through a filter in our order for our music to be heard, which by that I mean is we had to be signed by a record deal. You know, a record company, we got a record deal. The, our music somehow got on the radio, on MTV. We got exposure. We went on tour. Most bands don't have that nowadays. They're pretty much on their own. And there is no, you know, it's like uh, it's like going to, to a swap meet musically. There's stuff everywhere. Wow. Now there's music everywhere, whereas before... There was in whatever you, wherever you live in your town, there would be at least one radio station with top forty, and they would tell you what's cool and what you should be listening to and buying and going to the concerts because we're playing it. And it was up to you to you to choose. Of course, you know not every band that got played on top forty radio that I buy their records or went to see them, but there were some that I were never heard of. You know, and those, you know, those that resonated with me and those were. Of your tour, and then you will go uh, to, let's say you travel, you play in Detroit one night and then you were in Indianapolis the next day where in the morning when you, the bus arrives at the radio station and, you know, for the drive time and. Uh, you wake up, you roll out of bed, you go to the radio station, you say you, and then you get interviewed by the DJ for the show that you're doing that night, like in Indianapolis. And this goes on and on every single, every single city. That's how we did it 40 years ago with Quiet Riot. You know, so it's uh And nowadays it's I a lot really, of streaming. It's a lot of streaming and a lot of podcasts, like like we're doing, you know. Different, you know, and I love doing podcasts because it's not you know, when you do an interview with an actual DJ, the time that uh, the, the the time that you're going to be spending on the air with them is very short because it's all based on on advertising and playing music. So you don't get to spend half an hour talking to them, you know, or or getting these type of questions. It's music. It's just kind of like in and out. Like, okay, we're going to talk about your new thing and where you play. Guys are playing tonight, and maybe a couple of uh, road stories. If there happen to be like funny guys, you know, but, but, uh, but, the, but with doing a podcast, you know, I can go, we can go in any direction that we want and as deep as, as we want to get. For sure. And that's, what's really, really unique about it for mm. sure. And mm. I mean, there's also visual things nowadays as well. One other thing, um, of course, you've been on a lot of podcasts. You don't always get interviewed by somebody who's 18. So, <laughs> um, what would your advice be for kind of younger people in college um, in the range of 18 to 22, we'll say, who want to pursue music? I think this is a good topic to close on because I think advice that you would give, people are going to listen to a lot more than mm. the advice I could give to fellow classmates or dorm mates. Yeah. So what advice would you have on that aspect? You know, that is a good question. And I love doing uh, interviews with the younger generation because uh, I also want to find out how, what kind of challenges that you are facing today because we had different, a different amount of challenges, but there was a system. 
the, like I just finished talking about, there was a system of the of the you are you you're you're a band, you get signed, you do a showcase, you get signed by the label, and then you make a record. They assign an engineer, a producer, an artist relation person, and that's during the making of the record. And what happens is there's filters. They listen. The, the first album is, is basically, a, a, let's say, if the band's been together for five years, it's five years worth of songwriting that you go through. So a lot of first albums are filled with probably the most popular songs that, that those bands are going to be playing for the rest of their career if they become successful. And uh, so the record company goes and the producer, they work, they look at it because the producer has a um, an interest, financial interest. They're given points on the album traditionally they they'll go in produce the record and they'll get points on the sales from day one it's not recoupable traditionally that's the way it used to be okay so there's a vested interest in the uh for the uh, for the producer to produce hit and make it as big selling album as possible okay so then you have the artist relation guy who, is, who represents the record company and the record company is putting an investment they're creating a budget and also, they want a huge return, as big as possible, right? Just like, like, just like every investor does, right? And so they look at your, your, your songs, and they might say, okay, I like all of these, but we need an outside writer or a cover of a song. In case in point, that will, as, as insurance, as insurance, right? So like in our case with Quiet Riot, let's say we had... Come and feel the noise. That's what the producer and who happened also to be record company, the label owner, the um, decided that said you guys must record the song or we don't have a record deal. That that was a do and you that was like a break, a, a, you know either do it or we have don't have a deal breaking point within the contract. So it gets recorded. So now we have what the band wanted to record. And one song that the producer record company wanted to record as insurance to get this on the radio. So now, you know, it goes through the process is, you know, you get the, uh, whoever happens to be distributing the, uh, the album and working the record with the promotion uh, department and the marketing department, who in our case at that time was Epic record 40 years ago. And that's a whole different environment. They were not there during the making of the record. They just happened to pick it up. The record was done and, and our, our, our label and producer and owner of the label took it to different companies. And the ones who gave offered the best deal was the one that he went with. And the deal was that they were going to distribute market and, and, and do promotion for the album. Okay, so now we are working with a bigger label than we actually signed to because we actually signed to a production deal, which was very common back in the day. Because remember, when we recorded that album in 1982, it took a year for the album, you know, later on, a year later, it was released and it opened the doors to that genre of known as the Sunset Strip, you know, hair, hair metal or whatever. But hair metal bands were not getting signed or getting any attention at the time that we went in a year before to record that album in 1982. So the environment completely changed, right? So it was actually a, a production deal. Some bands like Motley Crue or Rat, they had, they even themselves made records independently and sold it around town in the you know themselves their own record label in order to get the attention from from the uh from the from the major labels you know so you know there were challenges and we only had one outlet if you have an independent record like motley crew or rap did unless you were working with a major label distributing that independent record you're not going to get on the radio because radio only had so much room top 40 there's only 40 songs on the playlist. That's all they play all day long, 40 songs, you know. Nowadays you go to Spotify and it's like a flea market. Everywhere you look, there's stuff. Where do you go? But so you have to you have to Google, you have to research it, your taste, word of mouth, you know, become uh, 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 social media, join the fan clubs, all of that. Looking for music back, uh, but you have the freedom now, freedom of choice. You know, you don't only have to listen to what the local 
station manager of the radio station says that this is cool. And it got to the point, you know, towards the end that, that a lot of it was, was based on payola. They were getting paid to pay to play the music. Fortunately, the music was really good. So it never got to the point of being being bad. But what happens is when you have some, let's say you have a hundred great songs to choose from, it's going to be, they, they need a little bit more incentive because they can only choose 40 from 100. Every week, the chart changes. So a lot of these, these uh, promo guys that work for the label, they have to give the station manager a little bit of incentive to get that song played, which turned out to be, okay, we're going to give you a, you know, what size TV screen do you want? <laughs> you know, stuff like that, you know. Uh, and that was considered payola, you know, whatever. But now, now it's just buying. You do the same thing on Facebook. You just buy advertising. It's the same thing. You're paying Facebook. Of course, it's not payola because it's it's legal. It's an ounce. You know, you enter a contract, a legal contract with Facebook about doing that. But but the bottom line is that money has to go from from this source, which is to whatever the label or the band to this other source to get promotion and to be heard, you know. So that's what you kind of advise the people how it works. Well, want to I, that's my reference. That was my world. And then that world ceased to exist. Now the world has become more of the Taylor Swift rap world. It's not anymore about rock bands being on top 40 or any sort of a top 100 list that it may exist nowadays. It's all based on record sales and stuff like that. Uh, and radio stations, you know, we, we pick and choose what we want to hear, whether it's through YouTube or Spotify or wh whatever, you know, everybody uses out there, you know, and that because there's new ones every day. So it's hard to, to catch up with everything. And uh, my, my advice, see, I, I have to go beyond the business and go back to where I started. You know, put you, you know, find the re the real, the true reason why you're making music. Because you're making music for a reason. Whether, whether it is my reason first was to 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 attract girls, and then it became the reality days that I love playing music. And then you be become identified. I am a musician, which is you must do that. You it, it cannot be a hobby unless you want it to be a hobby. But if you want to be a professional musician, you have to really identify yourself as a musician. Then you look at, let's say you look and see what made your favorite musicians, musicians, what sort of sacrifices will make sacrifices, you know, to spend hours and hours on our instrument or learning. Turn the sacrifice as a gesture of love. And by that, I mean is the ones you're doing is like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this that I used to consider boring and a sacrifice. And I find that I love doing it. And if I don't learn something new, every at least one thing new that takes me further in my musical journey, at least one thing new. If I don't do that, I'm not happy. I need that. That's the first thing that I do in the in, in daytime. And wow. even when I don't when I don't have the instrument in my head, thoughts, ideas, possibilities, they start coming up because once you gain so much information about music theory, then you become enlightened. Enlightened means that to me, it means that you know so much that you say, okay, if this equals this and this equals this, you put these together. Oh, I get this which is actually gaining a new perception on something that you already do. Look at it from a different point of view. We only got 12 notes, but you can turn those 12 notes into, you know, <laughs> altered tunings. You can do all of this different uh, rhythmic styles, you know, start listening to different cultures with their rhythmic patterns. You know, there's so many possibilities. It's, it's mathematics. If zero and one, two numbers, create an infinite possibility of sequences, imagine music with 12. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very good point. 
And just one last thing, any other advice or, you know, I mean, you really hit, hit on it, how you explained how it works with the point system, which is something that I've interviewed musicians and I'm going to be real with you. Nobody's ever discussed a point system with me yeah. like that when it comes to albums. So I really appreciate you sharing that advice. That's some new advice um, that no other musician has said on my show. So yeah. Yeah, well, maybe the musicians were not old enough to have actually experienced that because this is something that pretty much went away once uh, streaming. It started with, with Napster. Were you alive when Napster happened? I was not. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and some of us claim that it killed us, but no. No, actually, it, it just, you know, it was inevitable. Once you have technology that's able to do this and this and this and this and this, Trust me, it's going to be a fractals. So if you if you take this and this, apply technology to it, you create one something else. And then you couple it with something else. It's all fractal. It's going to keep going in different directions, but still it's going to create branches. It's like a tree, branches, and it's going to get fruit. Some of it might be sweet. Some of them might not be sweet enough from the same tree, but it's technology. And technology has been going on since fire. It all started with fire. <laughs> Very good. Imagine point. that. Imagine what fire hey, you can cook things, or you can heat, you can warp you, uh, yourself up. You can, you know, if you got a wound, you stick, you know, the log with fire and just like you know, close it. You can. There's so many possibilities with fire. You can do. You can kill people with fire. You can. You can. You know, do harm, or or you can do wonderful things with it. You know. And that's just one, fire. So fire, from fire came everything we have, including us being able to communicate. You're in, you're in the Midwest, I'm here in the coast. Interesting. Coast. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I got a timer on here, so my apologies okay. on that. Appreciate you my coming pleasure. on today. Do you have guitars behind you like I do right here? Is that what I see behind I will you? show you that? off camera. It's actually a drum set. Oh, well, okay. Appreciate Great. you coming on. Good. Give me one second. Thank you.